Thank you very much for hosting me, and certainly thank you very much to the Crell Institute for funding my graduate schooling. It's definitely been a delight to be able to go through school and, and engage in this program and to learn more about where our science fits in with the context of stewardship science. So without further ado, so fission theory is definitely very interesting. We have understand we've discovered nuclear fission since the 1930s and then very quickly studied it for various applications, especially nuclear weapons early on, but nuclear energy since then. So it was understood fairly quickly in terms of a liquid drop model, treating it as though it's a liquid drop of matter that's slowly splitting apart. And there, it, nuclear fission was also understood in a similar manner to the tunneling of an alpha particle for alpha decay, where you have the nucleus in a ground state and then it tunnels through some kind of a barrier to get out to where the two fragments have split apart. But then as you, as single particle effects are added on top of that liquid drop picture, you discover that there's a more complicated barrier structure between where the nucleus is in its ground state and where the two fragments have split apart. So we want to understand this from a completely microscopic perspective. Can we just take a basic understanding of how protons and neutrons interact with each other and have a predictive model for what will fission observables look like? What will the fragments look like? What will the spontaneous fission half-lives look like? So the outline for this presentation, we're gonna review how does the microscopic model density functional theory work for fission, and then we're gonna review some uh, the properties of uh, thorium and uranium isotopes that have a possible third barrier structure, a third minimum, where there's a possible st metastable isomer, as well as then the fission of mercury isotopes where a recent experiment discovered a surprising property. And then we'll just survey several even even actinides and how does this fission model work for spontaneous fission half-lives. So again, why do we want to do this? We want to have a good predictive theory of fission so that we have a lot of confidence in, in various, as we apply this to different fields. Anything from super heavy elements as new elements are being produced and added to the periodic table, we want to be confident in the prediction so we want to validate this model against where we do know data very well in the actinides. And then as well as for I hope you, as you were listening to Victor Reese's presentation, the idea of educating, the idea of you know scientists being very confident in their science, we can then communicate that to the public. We want to understand from the ground up everything that goes into whether a nuclear weapon or into nuclear energy, just have the most confidence to communicate to the public. So again, you know, more basic science applications of this theory. We do want to have a comprehensive universal picture of the nucleus and having an accurate model for fission is an important part of that, especially because we have so much data for fission available. And then again for, uh, so I mentioned briefly that we're interested in isomers, so just different a aspects of nuclear structure. So an experiment can measure uh, fission, fission probabilities as a function of excitation energy, and then that can be fit back to the barrier structure that the nucleus is seeing between ground state and fission. But that just becomes interesting, for, especially for recent experiments on things like uranium-232 in 2009. So how does this microscopic model work for fission? So the idea is we want to explore, we want to develop what is the potential energy of the nucleus as a function of its nuclear configuration, as a function of its shape. So we have three major shape variables in my simulations here. We have the elongation of the nucleus, how much is it stretched out like a football shape. We have the triaxiality, how much is it not uh, axially symmetric. And then we have the reflection asymmetry, how much is it pear-shaped. So, for the, so using this one-dimensional graph, the, this one-dimensional profile in this region where the, where the nucleus encounters the first barrier, it tends to break axial symmetry in the actinides. So this graph on the left shows how, how triaxial is the nucleus, how much is axial symmetry broken in that region. But then as you go beyond there, as you pass the first barrier and then go beyond into this, beyond the second barrier region and on to the split apart fragments, then it'll break reflection symmetry and you get pear shapes. So the idea here then is once we 
map out all map, map out the energy of the nucleus as it's possibly traversing into all of these shapes, and then a co more complete theory would want even more shapes to be able to be incorporated. But right now we're you know capable of doing three three coordinates coordinates at a time. So then it turns out that a good estimate for fission half-lives and other fission quantities can be achieved with a, essentially a least action principle. So you map out the path that has the least action, the tra trajectory of least action. That'll give you a very good estimate for fission half-lives. So we also want to, since you know, it's very rare for a nucleus to be in its ground state, especially when you're, you're thinking about uh, uh, whether a neutron-induced fission or even the fission-fusion reactions that generate or super heavy elements, then the nucleus is generally going to be in an excited state. So we want to have some aspect, how does an excited nucleus behave? So it turns out, so I present, you know, just for reference, I have the, this is the hartree fock bagoli above equation, and then this equation is solved to get the energy eigenstates as well as some sense of the wave function of the nucleus. But then, so that's the zero temperature hartree fock bagoli above equation. The effectively, once you've derived everything, the only difference then will be producing the nuclear density and the pairing density, which then depend on the temperature through a Fermi-Dirac distribution. So it's actually a very nice mathematical result too. But then what we do for the finite temperature formalism is we, we technically calculate free energy as a function of constant temperature, but then fission is not an, it's not an isothermal process by any stretch of the imagination. There's no heat bath keeping the nucleus at a fixed temperature, but it, we do believe that it's an isentropic process, that entropy is kept constant through the process. So there is a nice thermodynamic correspondence so that since this theory parameterizes the temperature, we calculate free energy as a function of temperature, but that does correspond to internal energy at, at constant entropy. So this, we exploit this correspondence to make our calculation life tractable. So I use a program called HFI that has been developed since the 90s and has been continuously added to. So we use nuclear energy density functionals of a skirm-like form, which is essentially a zero range force. And then my favorite force for this study, a lot of them I've used SKM star, and then the brand new functionals called UNIDEF, which I'll introduce on the next slide. So just, again, our attempt at achieving a, a universal description of nuclear physics. So it happens to be a one center Cartesian harmonic oscillator basis. And so 31 major shells with a deformed basis. And then all of, all of my calculations it's a, it can be done on a massively parallel computing platform that each nuclear shape that I've shown on the previous slides, each of these mesh points can be calculated on its own independent processor. So it's a very nice program. It scales very nicely. So there doesn't have to be a whole lot of communication between processors. So now, as for the advances in our density functional theory, trying to achieve this universal nuclear energy density functional, a universal description of the force for any nucleus. So here's the mathematical form for that formula. And then that is these, you know, all these constants, the coupling, co the coupling constants, and then the pairing coefficient right here. Those are fit to a variety of data from 72 nuclei that are, that I believe there are 60 deformed and then 11 spherical, some combination there. And then it's fit to observables like the masses, it's fit to observables like radii, that there's, it's not fit to anything fission. It's not saying, I want to get this half-life for whatever nucleus. It's fit only to the ground state properties. And then for the new unit F1 extension, that was fit to isomer states, so the energy of, a, of an elongated isomer. But it, again, it's not fit to fission cross-sections or fission barrier heights. So, that, so what this allows us is we're presenting a, a true prediction for every calculation that we have here. So we can move from the formalism into some of our physics results. So I got to study the third minima and thorium and uranium isotopes. So 
Exper so I described very briefly before that the, the barrier, experimentally, a barrier can be inferred from fission, from fission probability data that you can see resonances in that value that then they can try to fit a, you know, the wave form of the barrier to. But then, so for thorium-232 and for uranium-232, there were experiments throughout the years that say there should be a pretty deep third barrier area. However, when I do calculations with density functional theory, I get this very shallow area, and then I became curious, why? Why is it so shallow for DFT? So the first thing I did was I tried to apply the finite temperature formalism to this. What does the evolution of the fission barrier look like as you increase the excitation energy? So hopefully it's clear in this graph, but when you get to this 21 MeV curve right here, you can actually see there is a little pit developing that's somewhat deeper than it was for zero MeV. So that's actually pretty interesting. So that indicates that as you increase the temperature, you're eliminating some effect that then allows shell effects to take over and to create this pocket. So that's very interesting. So the same kind of thing happens in both thorium-232 and uranium-232. So another effect of increasing the excitation energy of the nucleus is the preference is that a preference for symmetry increases. So at the zero temperature, the most natural fission pathway is this very asymmetric path where you get very strong pair shapes, and then very strong pair shapes means very asymmetric product yields. Which that, and then so as you increase the temperature, the barrier to the symmetric pathway is lowered significantly. So that then it's so then. Fission can certainly occur along any of these points where you see the darker blue, but then, so it just becomes more likely for symmetric fission to happen. So this graph here shows old experimental data from the 1980s that shows some, a degree where as you increase the excitation energy of a, the nucleus in the experiment, that increases the symmetry of the fission. The, so it goes from 2% asymmetric fission at 10 MeV up to up to 10% at 55 MeV, and that's actually very well in line with what these calculations predict. So that's, you know, again, it's a very nice validation for what this model is doing. So along these lines, along with the finite temperature studies, I also wanted to, so I did a more comprehensive study. Once I did the actinide study later, I saw, well, the lighter isotopes of thorium and the lighter isotopes of uranium actually do show a somewhat deeper pocket. So thorium, for, so I showed thorium-228 in this picture here where the minimum is somewhat deeper. I want to make sure I'm grabbing the right area. But yeah, right here, it's deeper than it was for thorium-232, which I found very interesting. Why should the lighter isotope have a deeper minimum? And then I show this whole chain for uranium chains. So th the uranium-232, where experiments insist that there's a third minimum, is this red curve here. But then as you go to the lighter isotopes, uranium-228 and uranium-230, that's a pretty clear pocket. So that became interesting. So. Again, combining the ideas that we saw for the for, for increasing excitation energy, and then for so on this left-hand graph, I'm showing both the energy curve, the energy curve, and then pairing gaps. So all that to say that the as you increase the excitation energy, that also quenches pairing, so that the pairing effect in the nucleus is much smaller at higher excitation energies. So since Low pairing seems to correspond to a deeper pocket, as well as lighter neutron numbers. That indicates that there's some balance between shell and pairing effects that's creating a third pocket in the first place. So, so let me return to this slide. This slide, this graph up here, I'm showing you know the thorium-232 produced by several DFT models, several functional forms, and for the most part, you see there's not much of a third pit there. There's not much of a third minimum, uh, no matter what functional I used. So that, so from there, if DFT consistently predicts a shallow third minimum, does that mean that then DFT is hopeless for fission studies? If we can't capture this feature, what's going on? 
But then, so on the one hand, the experimental fission barriers are actually very model dependent that, that you have to put in a lot of assumptions and the, the analysis is very complicated. But let's say even that is so, if we have an, an experiment that says 100% third minima exist the way that everybody says they do, then if it 100% confirms that thorium-232 has a deep third minimum, then that is an important constraint for future optimizations for the energy density functional. And then the work that we've done with thorium and uranium chains does a nice job of saying, okay, so these are the features that you would want to implement in the functional. These are the shell structures and the pairing effects that would, that these are the conditions that would create a, a deeper third minimum. So moving on to another example of fission is the mercury isotopes where a very simple argument for shell structures of the, fra of the resulting fragments would say, well, zirconium-90 is semi-magic, so since zirconium-90 is half of mercury-180, then that should be the most likely fragment. But that kind of naive argument didn't work out in experiments, that once they were performing experiments at a low enough energy, they could see very clearly asymmetric fission happening. So there's both the macroscopic microscopic model generated by Moeller that shows a pretty clear preference for the asymmetric pathway, and then my own calculations with SKM star, so the zero temperature, a very clear preference for the asymmetric pathway, and then a much higher barrier against symmetric fission. But then I wanted to see, so as I increase excitation energy, do we see the same thing as we saw with thorium and uranium, that symmetric fission becomes more likely, and indeed, that's the case. So that's good that our model is still working as we expect it to for mercury. But then we wanted to see, okay, why should this be so and what happens across the mercury chain? So comparing the curves for mercury 180 and then a heavier isotope, mercury 198, it can be seen. So we, I present up here the same picture again for mercury 180, but then for mercury 198, it turns out at, at zero excitation energy, it's much less a asymmetrical for, for the fission path than for mercury 180. So, and then as you increase excitation energy, then there's almost no asymmetric fission. It's almost completely symmetric. So we wanted to see what's driving that, what drives mercury 180 to asymmetric fission, whereas mercury 198, a heavier isotope, much more strongly prefers symmetric fission. So we could see it actually very nicely and very clearly in the shell correction energies. So again, the, so this pathway shows the darker blue is the lower energies, and then that very closely follows what the, this fission pathway would have followed with the total energy surface. So for mercury 180, the shell structures drive the fission pathway towards asymmetry. For 198, however, the shell structures change so that a symmetric pathway is preferred. So this is actually a very nice study of an, an unusual case of fission where in the past nobody really thought mercury 180 would do anything special where the experiment found, oh, that actually fission's asymmetrically. We need to be able to capture this. So it was nice that with the DFT approach, it's not like we had to go back and say, we need to fix mercury 180 or anything because we got it wrong. The DFT already predicted asymmetric fission for mercury 180 and then symmetric fission for the heat, the extremely high energy case and for mercury 198. So finally, I get to transition to a much broader view where we try to, try to review how does the DFT perform for the, a broad array of even, even actinides, ranging from radium and then up to californium isotopes. So again, I'm especially trying to validate the brand new unit F1 functional that was produced by a great collaboration, trying to, fit, trying to optimize this functional for data across the nuclear chart. So in this graph, I get to show how from the original fit where which did very well for binding energies. As you deform the nucleus, it didn't perform so well with the original unit of zero fit. But then as the only thing that needed to be added was some data for the isomeric state. So 
this energy right here was added for four nuclei for two uranium isotopes, plutonium-240, and for curium-242. So that was enough data to constrain the surface energy so that then high deformation works out very nicely. So I'm sh I show the empirical barrier heights here, which are pretty closely reproduced by the unit F1 curve for plutonium-240. And then the more global ideas are down here. So I show the first barrier heights in this graph where the black squares are experimental or empirical points from the ripple evaluation. And then the second barrier heights are over in the right-hand graph. The red circles, I think, cir red circles are the unit F1 values, and then I use other functionals for the other colors. But in general, so the unit F1 does very well, especially for the second barriers that it does have, and then it had a somewhat lower RMS value for second barrier heights for the, act for the actinides that I studied. So that was very nice to see that come out. But again, I need to emphasize that fission barriers themselves are not observable. You can't just peek down and see what is the fission barrier height. It has to be inferred from fission probability data. So it is kind of a secondary and very model dependent observable. But what is a real observable is the, is the spontaneous fission half-life. That's something that can be clearly measured. So what I show here in this graph, I'm going to begin with the SKM star that, you know, what I'm using is a model called adiabatic time-dependent hartree fock which, again, is essentially taking, a pat, uh, taking an action integral for, for the nucleus from the ground state to a scission point. So already that model does very nicely. It captures pretty well the trends in the pretty well the trends in the spontaneous fission half-lives across what, it, what runs from about one year spontaneous fission half-life up to the 10 to the 20 years. So that's a huge range of experimental data. So that already performs very well with a, with a classic SKM star functional. With the unit F1 functional, I produce curves that actually, okay, they look very, very good. I did have to make a readjustment for unit F1 where the, an important quantity, the collective inertia didn't turn out well, but so all I had to do for unit F1 was I fit the, or I, I've scaled the, I scaled the collective inertias in a way that I would reproduce the spontaneous fission half-life for plutonium-240, and then I used that same scaling factor across the actinides, and that actually did very well. That was enough to then, again, it's spanning from one year spontaneous fission half-life up to 10 to the 20 years, and that is very nice. <laughs> so that's a very, it's, it's a very nice prediction for this microscopic functional. And then it also gives some feedback for future functionals. So, so the collective inertias are closely related with pairing values. And then it turns out that unit F1 had so, somewhat too low pairing values in the actinide region compared to this black experimental curve. So for the next optimization run, so there's another odd even mass difference for, for thorium-232, so that hopefully then this, this point will be pulled up and we'll have more accurate pairing values, more accurate um, collective inertias, which will then lead to even better predictions. But I hope you're seeing from these graphs that this model is actually doing very well for being a microscopic model that's, that's attempting to capture a, a huge amount of data from across the nuclear chart. So again, I just want to summarize the, the main conclusions that, so I studied why does DFT predict such shallow third minima for thorium and uranium-232 that it does seem to be very sensitive to the balance between pairing and shell effects, so hopefully we'll be able to contribute to future optimizations. And then, so we did successfully predict the asymmetric mass yield for mercury-180, and that was the very first study of, this, of mercury isotopes at finite temperature. And then the trends in the fission barrier heights and the spontaneous fission half-lives are actually re reproduced remarkably by UNIDEF. So this is all a very nice microscopic study that, you know, we're doing this to really build our confidence in predictions beyond known data and in communicating our scientific knowledge of the topic. So thank you very much for your attention.